Hello and welcome to another webinar with us here at Global Wonks as part of our series looking at how different sectors and industries are going to be impacted by the pandemic and the world that it leaves in its wake. I'm delighted today that we're joined by one of our advisory board members and a veteran of the media industry, Jay Lauf, uh, former CEO and chairman at Quartz and of course publisher at The Atlantic and Wide Magazine. Uh, as you know, uh, with these sessions, we dive right in. Uh, and today's session is going to be very exciting as Jay discusses with us uh, sustainable business models and how they should look, but also how business models have evolved in the media industry. A fascinating discussion, and I'm sure many of our uh, audience members today, especially from the investment community, uh, will find this a, quite a, an insightful discussion. So with that said, Jay, thank you for joining us. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Malal, and thank you all for uh, for joining us today. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, to clarify one thing, I'll probably dis do most of this discussion through the lens of my own experience, which is largely in uh, written word uh, journalism, whether that's um, been in uh, print uh, or digital. So, uh, you know, video, larger, you know, streaming services, that kind of thing, are not my um, are not my domain per se. Um, I come from a long line of, uh, of people in, uh, in media. My, uh, two of my uncles uh, on my dad's side, my, two brother, my dad's two brothers uh, were newspapermen. Um, one of them became an editor of a small town newspaper. On my mom's side, uh, I had an uncle who worked at Time Magazine and an aunt who worked at Sports Illustrated. So very early on in my, uh, in my life, I was um, imbued with this uh, belief in the power of, uh, of quality journalism to, uh, to have a positive impact um, in the world. And uh, it stays with me to this day. I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that um, high quality intellectually rigorous journalism is the uh, foundation uh, of, of a free and successful democracy. So I think figuring out these business models uh, has import beyond um, what might be the case in, in a lot of different industries. So I, I tend to be uh, obsessed with it. Um, I thought what I would do by way of entering the, um, the topic um, where I see sort of four main um, elements to successful business models and one, one major North Star that has, uh, has always been there um, and sometimes the eye is taken off of it, but it always comes back to it. Uh, is to tell, uh, to start with a cautionary tale um, from my early days in consumer media. And that is the story of Industry Standard. Uh, I don't know if you remember this magazine. Uh, I have a copy of this book uh, on my bookshelf, which I recommend as, um, as very interesting reading. But Industry Standard is one of many magazines that popped up in the, uh, in the early, uh, or excuse me, the late 90s. Um, as the internet bubble was um, was reaching its its apex, uh, Wired magazine, my alma mater, was launched in 1993 with the mission to um, explain how technology was changing the world in every dimension uh, to a, a group of people who for whom that that mattered deeply. In 1995, Fast Company um, was launched as a way of uh, looking at business and business leaders who were changing culture through a new way of doing business. But post those, or around the time of Fast Company anyway, a bunch of different magazines, Upside, Red Herring, uh, Business 2.0, and Industry Standard all sprung up um, to opportunistically take advantage of a condition that I saw firsthand when I was at Wired. When I was at Wired, I'd go on sales calls in Silicon Valley, and one that sticks out for me uh, vividly is going on a meeting with a company called HipBone.com. You've never heard of it. It's not around today. Um, but hipbone.com in, uh, in 2001 had an IBM size budget uh, and a 24 year old CMO uh, with ripped jeans who'd put his foot up on the desk and barely listened to what you were saying. Um, and hipbone.com could run a ton of ad pages in your magazine. Um, so I, I met hipbone.com and I saw the, the impact of a company like that when I was at business, the same publishing company that published business 2.0 the ad sales team would literally stroll in around 10 o'clock in the morning uh, and then check the fax machine for uh, insertion orders 
orders for advertising from companies that none of them had ever heard of or called on, including a company like hipphone.com, who might be running eight pages in the upcoming issue. And these guys would play Nerf basketball to see who won the account. Um, so those conditions existed where there was tons of money around. And so these magazines sprung up primarily to take advantage of that. And industry standard to sort of shorten the, the story here, none of them are around anymore with the exception of Wired and Fast Company. Um, industry standard is the most interesting of them because it sprung up in, I believe, 97 or 98. And by the year 2000, set a record that stands to this day for the most ad pages ever run in a magazine in a given year. I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of four to 5,000 ad pages um, in that year. By August of 2020, uh, to, of 2001, um, just eight months after this record year, it was out of business. Um, and the cautionary tale here is that uh, industry standard is emblematic of a larger problem that often occurs in media, which is that there's a low barrier of entry to launching a media property. And it's, uh, it's easy to sort of build, uh, build an audience and go capture advertising in the, in the strong uh, times and try to live off of advertising. Um, but if you don't really figure out what your raison d'etre is, if you have not figured out this thing, this is the North Star, who you are trying to serve, what is the target audience, and your mission to make yourself essential to at least the bullseye of that audience, um, you can't build a sustainable business model. And that's what happened with uh, industry standard and these others is they never really figured out what it was that they were doing that was essential or who their target audience was, where conversely, Wired Magazine was very clear on that. The mission was to discuss constantly to look five years, 10 years out uh, and talk about how technology was changing the world for a group of leaders who needed to understand that um, as an example. Um, and we've seen this repeated. So that's a, an example from the print era. But if you guys uh, know of and have, uh, have followed at all the trajectory of companies like uh, Mike, uh, which was a, a digital darling sort of news operation for the millennial generation or Upworthy, um, which had a skyrocketing um, you know, traffic story and then fell apart. I would even argue Huffington Post, which in 2011 uh, sold to AOL for $315 million dollars. Um, was just uh, bought in a, with undisclosed um, terms, but I do know that there were, uh, it's a, it was a stock swapping deal to, to BuzzFeed, have fallen really fast. And I would argue none of those brands um, really, again, um, looked deeply at, at what that mission um, is. And I'll expound on that in a minute. Um, a friend of mine uh, who is currently the CEO of Quartz talks about recent times in media uh, in terms of, of eras, and I'm going to borrow from, uh, from that for a second. Um, so I just was sort of describing a magazine, a print magazine heyday that, um, I don't know, depending on your, your uh, knowledge of history, ranged anywhere from you know, the 50s and 60s on up through, uh, through, the, through the early aughts. Um, but as the internet came on uh, and brands were either popping up, new, new brands were popping up or old brands were trying to figure out how to take advantage of uh, this, growing, uh, this growing internet audience, um, there was an age that I sort of refer to as the, uh, the banner uh, ad era. And the banner ad era is an example of the kind of thing, the disruption that can take your eye off of this North Star that I'm talking about. Um, banner ads, the first one was ever that was launched was launched by my alma mater, Wired. Um, and the problem with banner ads is that, the, um, is that they are terrible ways of, of conveying ad messaging. Um, they were intrusive uh, or, or they were too small. Uh, and therefore, a, a publisher could not charge a sustainable price for that advertising. Nobody ever clicked on those ads. If they clicked on them, it was inadvertent. So advertisers didn't value them. And where in the print world, you could get 90 to $100,000 per thousand views of an ad page. Uh, in the banner ad world, you were getting literally a uh, you know, dollar, two dollars, sometimes pennies um, on the dollar per thousand. So when you think about that, the only way for publishers to make any money was to serve millions and millions and millions of these banner ads. And what happened therefore is they took the eye off of the user and the user experience and with clickbait, with jamming tons and tons of rectangles into the uh, experience, 
um, with uh, all kinds of methods of trying to grow audience and cr serve more rectangles. They just tread all over the user experience and conditions got, got pretty terrible. And it was hard to, I think, for businesses to be sustainable in that, in that ecosystem. Um, the mobile era, which is the first one that my friend Zach uh, talks about, um, actually began to fix that as mobile became uh, ubiquitous um, for consumers. It became imperative, and I think Quartz, my alma mater, really led the way on this, to have tremendous, uh, to have successful mobile experiences, which started to put the user first again. And in that early, let's say 2012, 2013, 2014, um, lots of traditional brands and disruptor brands like Quartz um, really, I think, did a tremendous job of changing the user experience to, um, to take advantage of mobile. Following mobile was, uh, was another sort of uh, dangerous era for the, the business model, which was the Facebook era. Um, publishers, including Quartz and others, um, could grow tremendously on the back of the sharing of their content on Facebook. The problem here was that it you kept veering left and right and up and down based on um, what Facebook's priorities were, what their algorithms said, what they said would work. And again, you took your eye off of the customer. Um, it is an era in which um, clickbait headlines really um, proliferated. I can list some of them for you uh, for you guys later in Q&A if you want, but um, Frankenstein-y crazy um, headlines to get anything to do to get you to sort of click on content without really thinking about the quality of that content. What we're in now, and this will get me to the really to the punchline and the meat of this discussion, uh, sorry for the long history lesson, is uh, what I would call the reader relationship era, or actually what my friend Zach calls the reader relationship era. And uh, this is nothing new if you've been following media in the sense that um, publishing companies of all kinds are trying now to figure out how to derive uh, reader revenue, um, whether it is subscriptions uh, or memberships. Um, the New York Times um, has famously been incredibly successful at this, adding, I think, close to 2 million um, subscribers in the last year alone is up to 7 million um, subscribers and has really turned their business model around where they had not, they'd lost so much ad revenue in print, could not make it up in digital. Um, but the combination of their uh, accelerating digital ad revenue um, and, and wildly accelerating subscription revenue has created a, a, a really terrific model for, uh, for the New York Times. So we're in this era, the era that I think is really healthy in which publishers are being forced to really think about who their audience is and figure out how to serve them well and become essential because you can't have a subscription model, you can't have a membership model unless you know who it is that you are targeting and you're serving them in a way that will get them to open up their wallets and pay you for some part of that service. And I think this creates a virtuous um, ecosystem and cycle uh, that, that everybody from the consumer to the publisher will be able to take advantage of. So um, with all of that, I, I think there are sort of four key elements to business model success in publishing, which um, you know worked in an old era and work in, in this era today, um, and I think are too often uh, ignored. The first is the one that I keep citing, the, the North Star. Um, an audience first strategy, um, serving relentlessly and with intellectual honesty, um, the audience you are intended to serve and knowing what your mission is, um, is critical. Without that long-term sustainability is very, very difficult unless you get bought out and become part of a, a larger scaled conglomerate and your, your, you know, the, the, the mission doesn't matter as much. Second uh, important thing is nothing necessarily revolutionary, but is uh, revenue diversification. Um, you cannot survive uh, in the current world uh, based on advertising alone. There just is not enough of it go, to go around. Google and Facebook have snatched up tons of it and will continue to uh, do that, the lion's share of it. Um, so you need to diversify revenue. And I would argue diversify beyond even just uh, subscriptions and reader revenue. Um, some of the successful models um, that have emerged, uh, the Atlantic is a great example, another one of my alma mater, so I know it firsthand, uh, the New York Times as well, where you're getting revenue from not only subscriptions and advertising, um, but things like um, events or BuzzFeed has done a great job with, uh, with merchandising and, and licensing. Um, and I think that revenue diversification is going to be a critical uh, piece of, of the successful model moving forward. Last two things. 
uh, on, on that model are, um, are one is sexier than the other. The unsexy one is cost control. Um, part of the, in the industry standard story is that as they were hoovering up all of this print advertising that was laying around, um, they were spending wildly. They were, they were famous for having you know, classic Silicon Valley rooftop parties and all kinds of amenities for, uh, for staff. Um, and they did not have a chance to sort of retrench when times got tighter or to, to, uh, to control the, the, the model accordingly. Um, they, the costs just had ballooned beyond, uh, beyond sustainability. And so I think it's critical for uh, publishing companies to be numerate and to, to really understand uh, their P&Ls. Lastly is talent. Um, uh, again, in any of these cases where um, there's been failure, uh, there's been certainly talent at, at these organizations, but I think particularly on the business side, the talent pool in, uh, in publishing is, is very shallow um, uh, very often. A lot of good people have, have left because the business has been so difficult, um, but without really smart, talented, motivated people who can execute on the mission, um, you're, you're just going to fail. So I think those four things are the critical pieces of an audience first strategy, revenue diversification, cost control, talent. Um, if you, so I'm about to wrap up and then we'll get to Q&A. Uh, I'm running a little bit over, but uh, when you think about it, if you, if you think about the businesses currently that you would bet on to still be around the media businesses um, 10, 15 years from now, it's interesting how many of them, to me anyway, are traditional um, publishers because uh, they have done some of those things that I just cited. Uh, the New York Times is one that I mentioned. You look at the, uh, the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post, both of whom uh, have over 3 million subscribers at this point. Those are brands that have reascended, I would, I would bet on. On a smaller scale, brands like uh, the New Yorker and the Atlantic um, uh, you know, are beloved by their readership and uh, therefore are also doing ter terrifically at um, revenue diversification. Um, and then if you go down into niche publications, I think there are a lot of interesting niche players that, um, you know, Substack and platforms like Substack, uh, Scrollstack, Patreon are creating an opportunity for individuals. So if you haven't read Ben, ben Thompson's uh, Stratechery, um, it's often cited. Ben is one of the most influential uh, journalists currently in uh, technology and business modeling. And he's basically one individual in Taiwan who does the Stratechery newsletter and charges a premium subscription for it uh, uh, and is a thriving business. The information, uh, Jessica Lesson's venture out in the Silicon Valley is another one um, that is doing a great job of cost control, mission focus, uh, and, and revenue diversification. Um, so those are the companies that I would, uh, would bet on. And so I think there's a, a really uh, rosy future for um, high quality, um, both new and old publications, um, if they subscribe to this, uh, this model. Um, there are a couple of other questions that I can sort of get to uh, around the balance between um, technology and the human element around uh, the extent to which COVID has impacted publishing. Uh, and certainly there's a big, hairy, separate conversation to have around local news and the gutting of local news. So it's hard to cover all of this in, uh, in just 15 minutes. I'll stop there so that we do have time for Q&A. I hope uh, that that was uh, useful and instructive.